person that we have uh, joining us on this event today, which I'm really thrilled that he could do it, is, is Chris Radick, who is currently muted. Uh, but Chris is a specialist in Accutrons and tuning fork watches, but also uh, general timepieces. Uh, Chris, you want to unmute yourself and talk a little bit so that the screen will switch to you? Oh, hi there. Uh, I'm Chris Raddick. I've met Tim and Tim, and I don't think I've met the rest of you, but if I have, uh, remind me. I'm an independent watchmaker in Lincoln, Nebraska. And like Tim said, I uh, repair all sorts of timepieces, but I do specialize in some of the early electronic stuff especially Accutrons and the other tuning fork watches. So I haven't seen Tim's presentation yet, but I'm looking forward to it. And I'll, I'll have some, uh, I, if we were in person, I would bring some stuff and have a little bit of hands-on and show you some things. And I'm gonna try to simulate that here with the camera in my microscope and some other stuff that I've got planned out. So, Super. so I hope it works out. I'm new at this, so. Sounds great. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, you joining us. And so how I'm going to orient this is I'm going to go through my presentation fairly quickly, which is going to be a little bit about the creation of the Accutin, and then I'll let Chris speak. I do have a bunch of watches that I've taken pictures of, and I also can show them live. I think that, you know, from a collector's standpoint, there are you know, a lot of different areas with tuning fork watches that you can specialize in should you choose to. So it's a real interesting place to uh, collect in, and it's not particularly expensive in, in many respects. People are scared of them, and so they don't always command the crazy prices that you might expect. Having said all of that, and I will start the uh, screen sharing. Are you ready? Because I want you to pay attention. There you go. She got it. Something. Do you have time to improve your life? Do you have precisely 30 seconds for a word from Accutron watches? The watch appears, bottom third. The second hand moves with a fluid sweep, and above it, Accutron time. You go into a business meeting. Is there food in your teeth, ashes on your tie? Then you've got nothing to say. The meeting is boring, but you can't be. But you're wearing an Accutron. This watch makes you interesting. It's a board meeting. It's black and white. We hear light traffic, no talking. We just see our man, you, late 20s, shaggy, the youthful colic, but in a suit and tie. This is a businessman staring at his watch as muffled conversation swirls around him. Now we just hear the electronic hum. Oh. <laughs> he stands up and the faces come into view. A couple of white-haired men and a contemporary who looks like Steve McQueen. You shake hands and Steve McQueen gets a look at your watch. We hear the first words. Is that Swiss? Now we're in color. And it's a little interview for the two of them while the other men look, outlining the benefits of this watch. It is Swiss. It is accurate. It is the height of design and technology. Accutron. It's not a timepiece. It's a conversation piece. Super. Wow, ready. That's all right. So hopefully you heard that pretty well. Um, <laughs> I totally forgot that was even in there, to be honest. I'm I've watched that show at least twice all the way through. And I totally forgot that was in there. You can find this on YouTube. If you do a um, YouTube search on Accutron Mad Men, it's the first thing that comes up, you know, but uh, I found that when I was getting ready to do my first presentation and it just, uh, I just love that, <laughs> that, mm, <laughs> you know, and Chris, uh, Radek can talk about this a little bit uh, some when, when he gets going in terms of, of the humming. Some Accutron and tuning fork watches are pretty quiet and you don't hear them and others are incredibly loud. And if they're in your bedroom, you know, you can't sleep because you hear them. And if you get multiple ones in a watch box, they start resonating slightly. So you get this low frequency. Uh, resonance uh, going on is their frequencies are slightly off so but i'll do a um, another share screen here okay can everybody see this 
Can yes. Yep. 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 It's good. So um, this is um, an Accutron 214. This is the first tuning port movement uh, that was developed by Max Hetzel and, and the Bulova Watch Company. Follow-on ones uh, were developed by Bulova in terms of Bulova products, and then uh, Max Hetzel had at that point left uh, Bulova and eventually was working for a subsidiary of, of Omega, and they developed the Swiss version of the tuning fork watch. So that was the back side showing the battery compartment. This is the front side showing you see a transistor and resistor and the tuning fork, a few other things there. This is what a, how a tuning fork watch works. It has a saw tooth kind of wheel that they call the index wheel. And there's a two jewels on really fine springs. One of them is attached to the tuning fork and it moves and the other one is fixed to an adjustable uh, stop that allows them to precisely adjust the position of where the index wheel comes to a stop. The original tuning fork watch that Max Hetzel had designed did not have the second paw that, that locks the wheel in, in place, and he had a lot of troubles uh, as a result of that. Uh, this is a drawing showing tuning fork. So you see kind of uh, bits of, of the fork itself with a uh, red tipped uh, wire coming off of it going to the index wheel and then Actually, the red tip is the fixed one, and the uh, the brown tip one is one that's attached to the tuning fork that actually moves. The gear train in a tuning fork watch isn't under a whole lot of load, and so it can actually drive through a lot of dirt and, and worn out parts quite well. It's, it's rather interesting how it works. This is a schematic for the um, circuit that uh, Max Hetzel designed. And uh, anyway, it's if you know schematics, uh, you, you'd understand it. This is a 218 movement uh, showing the uh, the two ruby jewels on, on the tip of those, those fine spring wire tips. And then those things are carefully adjusted using collets and little pointy tools and a steady hand. And uh, I'm not very good at it. I'm sure Chris is very good at it. These are some index wheels. Um, they're, they're very fragile, very fine. And I think probably most of these aren't usable at this point. And they are often sold and shipped in these little pill containers. And there's a tuning fork and a couple of the fixed uh, paw assemblies. There's an eccentric screw that you turn that adjusts the uh, position of that fixed tool. So how did uh, the Accutron come about? And the fact that it even existed at all uh, versus just going from electric balance wheel to uh, quartz is kind of interesting. And it's all because of Max Hetzel. Before that, uh, Lip, a French company, uh, Fred Lip, uh, was developing electric um, watch movements. And they had partnered with Elgin in the early 50s to continue development of balance wheel watches. So they started in 1928. This is all, as we were talking earlier about lifting things off the internet, this is all cut and paste off the internet. So in 52, Lip and Elgin announced um, a prototype of their electric watch. And it's, it's a balance wheel timed device driven by uh, new miniature batteries. Um, batteries were really one of the limiting technologies for, for small electric uh, horology was you had to make something small enough to uh, fit in a watch. Uh, in 1957, Hamilton uh, launched their first electric watch, the 500. And uh, Lip still was trying to deal with technical issues. And they were, all of these things are related to super fine little contacts off the balance wheel. This is the first Lip electric uh, movement. It used two oval shaped batteries that they produced and they had a tendency to um, explode occasionally. So that wasn't so great. And then this is the modern uh, based lip. So anyway, this is um, the modern uh, lip movement and they call it electronic because that little blue thing above the copper coil on the upper right hand side is a diode 
So you got one electronic component, so they call it electronic. And uh, a little bit on the Hamilton electric movement. So they, you know, first electric clocks were actually go back a long way, 1814. Uh, English gentleman uh, invented the very first um, electric clock, and uh, Breguet was uh, still alive at that point, I believe. Here's the Hamilton 500, and you see two fine wires coming off posts going towards the base of the balance wheel. And those are the contacts that are so fussy. And Hamilton didn't even allow their field service guys to work on the 500. If you had one that needed work, you had to send it uh, back to Hamilton at, at first. Tuning forks were also uh, used in horology. And <clears throat> this is a picture out of a NAWCC uh, publication. Breguet's nephew uh, designed this, invented this clock in, I think, 1840-something, uh, 1866. So this, this is in the, uh, I believe, the MIH Museum in um, Chaffons, Switzerland, yeah, details on the clock, some of his patent deals. Basically, you see like a, a, a fork going to an escape wheel on the tip of of the, one of the tuning fork tines. Kind of a slick design, but I can't say that I've really seen any of these out there, so I don't know that they really made many of them. So here's a picture of uh, Max Hetzel. This is pulled from a website that his daughter had created that's no longer up. Uh, it's an AOL page. Uh, I found this on uh, web.archive.org. They have images of, of websites and pages going back um, for a long period of time. And so you can find some of these older pages still out there. Uh, the tuning fork watches, I had a really strong following, I think around 2000 and, and thereafter, but uh, people that had been driving the websites uh, such as um, Hetzel's daughter and uh, people like Chuck Maddox, um, they've passed away. And so things have kind of faded away. Tom Mister, who ran the uh, tool and watch part website, uh, Dash 2, he had an awful lot of information, ads and things on Accutrons as well. All his inventory, he's passed on to, I believe, Dave, who advertises on the NAWDC websites. So a little bit on Max. He was born 100 years ago in March of 1921 in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, he had a strong interest in technology things as well as uh, nature and science. Um, but he, he got him a master's degree in electronics and his diploma work was electromechanical frequency filters for telegraphy. And basically I think what they're doing is multiplexing multiple telegraph um, signal channels on one wire using the Morse code signals at different frequencies. And then they use these electromechanical filters to filter out the individual um, channels on, on the receiving end. Max had served in the Swiss uh, military as, as all Swiss males have to do for like a year and he was a communications person. So he had some experience with this. But these uh, magnetic filters, they happen to use tuning forks in them. So he um, had early experience with, with tuning fork uh, products. He was a um, kind of a physics oriented person and he went to work for a uh, R&D facility where one of the things he did was design spherical optics for the first projection TV systems out there. So he was able to do optics uh, design as well. Uh, but uh, he mostly did electromechanical uh, filters you know, at that point. He didn't get paid very well doing that, and he wasn't able to convince the company to give him any patent royalties for the patents that he had um, gotten for them. So he found a job with um, Bulova in 1950 in BLBN, Switzerland, 
uh, where Bolivar was founded and, and had a factory there. He was uh, in charge of working on um, automating or applying electromechanical automation to uh, watch manufacturing systems. So he worked there as um, until 59. Uh, and then in, in um, 59 through 63, uh, he, he was uh, given the position of chief physicist at Bolivar Watch Company in New York. And uh, this is all kind of related to some politics around the development of the, the 214 movement. And uh, then after 63, he came back to Switzerland and worked for a couple different, um, had a couple different positions, but he eventually ended up at, at Omega and uh, did tuning fork designs for them. Here's a picture of uh, Max in 1962 with a big picture of, of the Accutron. Watch it, perhaps uh, one of the trade fairs, perhaps the Basel World Show. So in uh, the, the early days, so 1952, when Elgin and, and Lip uh, announced their um, electric watches, Ard, Arde or Ard Bulova, who was the son of the Bulova founder, Joseph Bulova, uh, was worried about electric horology and what it was going to do to Bulova. And Bulova was, was having some financial problems at that point. Sales weren't that strong. So um, Arde came to uh, be able to talk to the people there in, in Switzerland and his watchmakers didn't really know anything about the electric balance wheel watches, but they knew that uh, uh, Max Hetzel uh, had an interest in it. And so they had him talk to him. And so Arde gave Hetzel the job to um, give him a report on, on these balance wheel watches. And um, in he reported back to him that the balance wheel movement was was interesting, but wasn't a dramatic improvement in accuracy. There was some improvement in accuracy because the battery provided more consistent power and a bit more power to the balance wheel um, to drive the train, but it really suffered from all the same mechanical shock problems of, of a balance wheel watch. So Max um, presented his idea of using a tuning fork to um, Mr. Bolova because he felt that the higher frequency would lead to higher accuracy. And Arde Bolova was, was very interested in this and gave him the go ahead to start working on it. And Bolova was really um, strong with the military. Um, they're very patriotic. Joseph Bolova started a watchmaking school for uh, returning veterans from the war uh, and was a leader in, in employment of people with disabilities caused by war injuries. And Omar Bradley was chairman of the board for Bolova. So Bolova had access to uh, new technology things and they were able to get uh, some transistors that had just been invented a few years earlier. So 53, Max gets um, his first new transistors and he starts working on his designs. And in 53, he applied for his first patent on tuning fork watches. And uh, 54 miniaturized batteries become available and Bolova is also able to start providing some super fine copper wire for making the uh, coils for the tuning fork. So there's a lot of development uh, going on to try and make things work right and there were some challenges along the way. Uh, Max was working pretty full time on this which was a problem for his boss because his boss was responsible for dealing with automation issues on the production line and Max is working on this tuning fork watch. So, you know, he's getting some, you know, he's got a lot of conflicts going on, but he does get one working. He, he does make a watch and uh, not being a watchmaker is a challenge for him, but he got one watch working and he wore it for a month and then um, Mr. Bolova took it back to the U.S. and then uh, Max worked on some more and they had some issues but in um, 
55, Max has taken off the, the tuning fork project and the project is transferred to the United States, to Long Island. And uh, they produced um, some through 1957. Uh, Max was pretty unhappy at that point and he actually applied for a job uh, with Omega. Omega did give him a job offer, but he couldn't work on electric watches. And Max just wanted to work on his tuning fork watch. So um, at that point, New York um, decided to offer him the physicist uh, chief role in, in New York. And he relocated, Max relocated to New York for four years. And so when the first thing they did with Max Hetzel when he arrived is they made him try and figure out why their prototype watches would stop working after a few months. And it was all related to the fact that the design only used one paw finger with the jewel on it. And the, it depended on a brake on the index wheel to uh, keep the wheel stable as, as the paw got withdrawn to the next tooth. And unfortunately, you couldn't adjust that brake accurately enough over and keep it adjusted over time to make it work right. But uh, this was a case where the Americans working on the team um, really stepped up and figured it out. And the adding of that second podule really made the Accutron a, a workable design. They had other issues associated with, you know, getting the, the geometry of the, the fork just right and the magnets right. And, you know, a lot of things that you were doing with that computer simulation, these are all slide rules and figuring it out on paper. So it was pretty remarkable. But uh, by 1960, uh, end of 1960, the first Accutrons were presented to the public and they worked really well and sales really started taking off for Bulova. Here's a picture of one of his uh, prototypes. Uh, this is in the MIH museum, obviously a very crude, but functional little product dial side and a, another version of one in something that you could put into a case. Here's some of his patent uh, drawings. After uh, Max left Bolova and, and returned to Switzerland, he worked on uh, a, a new tuning fork watch, which was called the Swissonic. And it uh, had a interesting movement design. And unfortunately, it didn't go any worse because both of us sued them for uh, patent infringement. Turns out that Elgin also sold a, a watch called the Swissonic, but it's a balance wheel watch. <laughs> so anyway, so there's a book on Accutron watches uh, done by Daryl Hansen. Uh, and it's got a lot of interesting pictures. Uh, he's got a lot of salesman photographs uh, that Dieter Huss uh, provided. And so the book is mostly, um, other than some introduction on the various types of movements, um, tuning fork movements, uh, it pretty quickly goes into, you know, the types of things that were out there. And in terms of competing tuning fork watch designs, ESA, which was the subsidiary of, of Omega, is like Elsior um, SA. Um, they designed um, a product that was under license from Bolova, and then um, Citizen, which was a partner manufacturer for Bulova for Caravel movements, they were given the rights to build their own design as well. Nobody else was allowed to, to build tuning fork designs. The Russians and the Chinese did do their own copies, and Chris Radek has worked on some of these and can talk about them some. They're very rare. But this shows an example of what's in um, this collector's book uh, showing list of types of watches and their movement base and then what page you can find uh, more detail on them so this is showing like space views and then they have pictures these were the salesman pictures that would have been in a big I guess, binder that the salesman would have showing various types and, and prices. These are pictures of some of the different tuning forks out there. Um, some pretty crazy designs. And you can see on some of them, the magnets are cylindrical plugs. And on others, as they evolved, they turned into 
cones, you know, that basically help to regulate the amplitude, I believe. These are some tools uh, that you find. If you go on eBay, you find a lot of tools. Uh, so case back wrenches, some movement holders. For the most part, you don't really need any of these. This is a meter that you use for trying to set up and adjust um, the tuning fork watches. And there is a bit of a an art to this. The two movements you see down there the, on the left is the 218, which was designed after uh, Max Hetzel had left Bolivar, and the movement on the right is the 214, which is Max's design. And then these are some little tools used for adjusting. You can find uh, these service manuals both in hard copy off the internet, off eBay, and at uh, NAWCC regionals, and I believe you can probably find online versions of these as well, PDFs. So they show you how to adjust uh, your little um, finger, spring fingers and such. This is a picture claiming uh, how simple the Accutron was compared to a self-winding watch movement and a uh, list of parts, more of that adjustment page. This is how you hold the index wheel. You can get these little tools or you can modify uh, tweezers. This is a good catalog to have if you're trying to find crystals and gaskets and crowns and such for your Bulova watches. On the inside of the back cover of the Bulova case, there's a printed number. Sometimes it's engraved, sometimes it's printed, but this one uh, is a 2976. And so you look up that reference number and then it gives you it tells you what movement was in that watch it tells you what the crystals are gives you some references to other pages and uh, actually it's 2975 so you would go go across and there's you know different um, references there and you know just tells you what case wrench to use and such in the 218 this little wheel here is a clutch wheel and basically the tuning fork drive uh, goes to this wheel and then this wheel through the clutch drives the time train and the date change mechanism you'll find 218 based tuning fork watches that the second hand works and you swear it's working fine and then you realize the time doesn't advance and i bought a few of these at NABC regionals thinking that they were good and the people selling them thought they were good. I don't think they knew and I didn't know at the time. So Chris can talk a little bit more about this, but if you have a day-date um, Accutron, these things are a pain in the ass to get to. And this is out of a uh, NAWCC bulletin on servicing the Accutron watch. So you start with your 218 day-date hands, you got to pull the hands. So you pull the hands and the dial off, and then you got the date disc and, and the day disc. And then you got to take, you know, one disc off and there's a spring and a, and a little detent delay. And then you got to um, pull off yet another bridge and there's more detents and more springs in there. And you're still not done. You still have more stuff you have to pull off to get to that wheel. And so finally you get it off after all these steps. So with 218s, if you're concerned about reliability and trouble-free low cost service, you probably want to get a time only version, but they're kind of hard to find because most people wanted um, day date at that time. The Accutron was also used in industrial applications and in military applications. Um, they were in a number of spacecraft on instrument panels and F-4 Phantoms and um, on the Apollo um, spacecraft and such. This is a little panel-like timer. It's a 214 with the adjustment knob on the front and a contact on the top. And I'm not sure what, what it does. You could get them configured in many different ways. Uh, this is a kind of strange long duration electromechanical timer thing. Inside this case at the very back, there's a um, 214 movement and then a disc um, driven by this movement that releases a, um, a spring device that then trips the switches after some period of time. Um, these are some clocks. Uh, this is a simulated aircraft clock. Um, the screws on the front are fake. They're molded in um, on mine. Somebody actually tried to take the screws off. 
it just flips up to reveal a 214 movement. I see a lot of clocks based on the 214 movement. Uh, they're, they're kind of fun. And the hands have to be, second hand has to be counterbalanced um, and the view from the back. And this was their first quartz driven clock. And uh, it had a large um, quartz crystal in it and a crazy 214 movement with a very long setting handle going all the way to the back through two circuit boards. And this is a factory thing. Uh, Chris Radick has this now, but this is a container that holds index wheels for the 214. So this particular one had only a couple trays of wheels left on it, but it's kind of interesting to see how they handled these super delicate parts in the factory. I haven't seen how they handled the little tines though, the little spring tines with the jewels on the end. And uh, so this is a sign I've got some stuff that you can find out there on the internet. And these are some ads that I've pulled off the Dash 2 site. Um, so anyway, I'm going to stop sharing. Thank, thank you, Tim. It's a nice, nice introduction. Very well done. Hopefully I didn't ramble too long. Uh, I guess I did. It's an hour has gone by. Chris, do you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That was cool. Um, I hadn't seen some of those photos before, especially the early prototypes that showed that there was a worm gear on the index wheel. That's uh, That survived into the 221 movement, one of the women's watches. So it's much smaller. And I didn't know that. That's really neat. Um, I had a, I had a few things that I wanted to share. Um, I I want to sh try to share the sense of awe I have about these and um, how revolutionary they were at the time. Um, on my on my microscope here, I'm going to see if I can show you is the standard U.S. dime that all but one of us is probably familiar with as a as a size standard and on it, if I can get it in the right place, I'm gonna set an index wheel. This is a bad one that I've got, so I'm not nervous about handling it. Usually you don't wanna to touch the edges of these because that thing has 320 teeth on it. And that's pretty amazing. And like Tim was talking about getting the, the vibrating tuning fork finger to advance that one tooth at a time, one tooth per vibration was, obviously a huge obstacle to making these things reliable. Um, and so after that, let me show you one that's running. There we go. Under that jewel is that index wheel. Um, the lower of the fingers, like Tim said, is attached to the tuning fork, and I think you can probably see that it's vibrating. And the top one is stationary, and for each vibration, it's a, it's moving that wheel one of those tiny, tiny teeth. And um, these, because of the higher frequency, these keep better time than mechanical watches, but. Um, one of the interesting things about them is that um, there is some positional variation uh, because of the influence of gravity on the tuning fork, but they were all exactly the same. And so um, the jewelers were told to regulate them in a way that um, that predictable adjustment gave good timekeeping. And let me show you. Uh, this is a tuning fork out of a 214. And I'm putting it on my smallest screwdriver here. And as you can see, um, it wants to hang this way because the foot is on one end and the cups are on the other end, the cups with the magnets that the coils go into. And so um, gravity influences that quite a bit. And I'm going to point my, my, my camera here down at my timing machine, which I've placed on the desk. And I've got here, here's, here's my hands-on demonstration. Here's one of my 214s. Um, if I place a dial up on the sensor here and wait for it to give a reading in a few seconds, 
It should be around minus 2, oh, well, 1.2. A well-regulated Accutron dial-up will be minus 2, and let me show you why. If I rotate it now and put 12 o'clock down, it's going to be faster. Plus yeah. 2.7. So it's about 4.5 seconds faster uh, when the tines are down than when uh, the tuning fork is flat. And if I turn it the other way, uh, let's see. I'm going to have to hold it here to get a reading in this direction. But this is with 12 o'clock up. And you'll see it's quite a bit slower. It's about minus 6. And now with a mechanical watch, that kind of span, plus or minus 4.5 seconds, would be a pretty darn good adjustment. Um, and you get a watch that keeps really good time. But with these, um, they all have the same adjustment. And it, it um, was maintained over servicing and stuff like that. And so it was really predictable and they were really easy to regulate. Um, because I have another Accutron on my wrist now. And when I'm sitting normally, do, you know, drinking my coffee or whatever, 12 o'clock is down. And so it's running a little bit faster. And it's very hard for me to put 12 o'clock up. It's a position that you don't spend much time in. And so um, when you regulate these, you want them to be a little bit slow when they're flat. Uh, so they keep good time. Later, um, the, uh, the Swiss tuning fork movement that Tim was talking about, like what's in this, this uh, mega constellation here, is the ESA 9162. And it also has a tuning fork. And it has an index wheel that looks almost exactly the same. It has the two fingers that look almost exactly the same. Uh, let me put it under the microscope and show you. This, uh, this Omega one is particularly well finished. It's got uh, gold plating on the, on the pillar plate and so on. And if I can zoom in, you may be able to see in that hole. I wish this were bigger on my screen. It's in focus, but you can't see it. Let me try turning it around so the light shines in. There okay, is. there it is. You can just barely see it. Same thing. Exactly the same design. Um, the ESA group licensed this from Bolova. And if you look at the index wheels, they look the same. And I kind of suspect that Bolova was involved in manufacturing those. But of course, I don't know that for sure. Maybe Tim does. And so, But what's interesting about these, and the reason I showed this, let me switch cameras again is the tuning fork in these is a little bit different. And if I do the same thing and put the tuning fork on my smallest screwdriver and show it to you, if I do it carefully, if I rotate it, you see what happens? That thing is balanced. They move the foot of the tuning fork into the center. So it doesn't have, well, it's not quite balanced. It's a lot more balanced than that first one I showed you. <clears throat> and the reason for that is to fix the, the uh, positional adjustment so gravity doesn't influence it so much. Let me point this back at my timer. Here we go. And do the same thing. I set this on there. This is dialed down just because I have to back off. Dial up would be the same. About plus two, plus two or plus three. And now if I take this and put the 12 o'clock down, put it back in there. It's the same. So that's the big advancement in the Swiss movements, the Swiss tuning fork movements. It's kind of like the, the Accutron, but perfected a little bit. They have other features that I don't like as much as the Accutron, but boy, the design of that tuning fork is really neat, the way they balanced it. Later still, some of you might recognize this fairly iconic watch, which is huge. 
but this is uh, the Beta 21 movement, which doesn't have a tuning fork anymore. But if I can get just the right thing in there. Not too far. You can see it has an index wheel. That's the same. It has a different number of teeth, but uh, same setup, same two fingers. On this one, there's no tuning fork anymore. And let me get something to point with here. Get my tiny screwdriver. Above there, right here. That thing you can see is blurry on the left end over here. That's because it's vibrating. They've dispensed with the whole tuning fork and they've put in a vibrating blade instead that's run by electronics. This is a quartz watch. So it has a quartz oscillator and the quartz frequency is divided down until it can vibrate this blade here. And that runs that indexing mechanism that has survived into the quartz revolution now because that was a good way at the time to translate this vibrating into rotary motion. They didn't have tiny stepper motors yet. And this uh, will have no positional dependence because it's a quartz watch. If I would, let's see, can I time this one? Let's see if I can get a reading on it. Chris, what is the make and model of that watch? This is an Omega Electric Quartz F8192 Hertz. Thank you. Um, let me see if I can get a, a closer focus here. We will. There we are. Now it's in focus. Yeah. Really iconic watch. <clears throat> these are a little bit less common. Well, these are a lot less common than the Accutron. <clears throat> There's also um, a earlier quartz that uses the same technology. That's the Longines 6512. I don't have one of those to show you because I've only ever had a couple of them in my hand. Extremely rare. And um, I think there are probably only a few in the world that are still keeping time. <clears throat> uh, so, okay, so I showed you the tuning forks. I showed you the positional uh, gravity dependence. Um, what happened when the fork was gone? Oh, Nan asked about the um, Aki Quartz, which was a transitional movement. Um, it was based on the 218 very closely, and they added a quartz to it, kept the tuning fork just the same, but instead of the tuning fork resonance being the timekeeping, um, the, uh, the quartz oscillator is the timekeeping. They divided it down and ran the tuning fork directly. So it has the same mechanism, same index wheel. It actually looks a lot like a 218. But to regulate these, let's see if you can see it. See those tiny screws there? Yeah. Those are actually electrical switches. And by moving those screws around or adding or removing them, you change the load capacitance on the quartz crystal. And that's how you regulate the Aki quartz is with these tiny screws, not by adjusting the mass of the fork the way you would regulate the 214 or the 218. So these, I'm going to read this one on the, on the timer. I'm not sure how regulated it is right now. But of course, again, no positional dependence. Put the timer in a different mode to read the Aki chords here. Plus 0.2 seconds a day. That's a pretty good timekeeper. And these uh, will be consistent over the years. They keep their adjustment really well, these, these early quartzes. <clears throat> and so, Nan, that's what you've got in your Aki chords. Very cool late tuning fork watch. Okay, I think I'm about to wrap it up, but I want to show you one more thing um, that Tim touched on, and that is the advertising for these um, said that they don't need routine service. Uh, the timekeeping doesn't really matter on whether it's clean or dirty, and that is true enough. But um, if you don't service them, they will destroy themselves. They, um, the, the 
tuning fork motor is very strong and long past when a mechanical watch would stop, these just keep running and they just grind themselves up. And I wanted to show you, let's see, I have to reconfigure my microscope a little bit so you can see this. I'm 47 years old, I spend half my time switching glasses when I'm fixing watches. It's a beautiful uh, scope. What is that? This is an M scope. And I actually have two of them. There's one set up over my lathe too. And I really like them. They're, um, each of these is under $500 bought new. And so um, they, they have a good zoom. They stay in focus over the zoom range. I really recommend them if you work on, if you work on watches at all. Here's a couple of wheels that... Um, we're in my junk pile. Of course, a watchmaker never throws anything away. Let's see if I can get it in focus here. I'm not sure. That's really small on my screen. Here we go. On that left wheel, if you look at that top pivot, you might be able to see that it has a big old shoulder worn in it. And that is from it um, being in a dirty jewel. It didn't have oil. And it runs and runs and runs, and it keeps running until you can see on the right wheel, those pivots are completely gone. And sometimes it'll run past when the pivots are completely gone. And I'll just find them stuck in the jewel with a little bit of rust or something like that. And so if these aren't clean and oiled every decade or so, they'll chew themselves up. And like Tim was saying on the 218, one of the customary places that they get worn out is that center wheel clutch. Uh, and that clutch is there so that you can set the hands so when you set the hands, if there's no grease on that part, it'll just eat itself up and then it'll be too loose to run the hands anymore normally. So get them serviced. They, they last forever. No parts wear out as long as they've got oil every decade or so. Well, I think that's the end of my planned presentation. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to do my best. I'll let people uh, ask questions uh, first, and then I have a few comments uh, and to, to make about uh, the presentation. Chris, what what uh, estimate would you have for the range of a, a ten year servicing on one of these watches? My my base price for servicing right now, uh, for all except the astronaut models, which have extra parts, is one hundred and sixty dollars. And I find that most of them only need the basic servicing. Um, uh, some, uh, like Tim was saying, have bad coils and those, uh, I rewind those and repair them, uh, which is a very labor intensive. So those are a little bit expensive. Yeah, I can imagine, yeah. But the basic Thank servicing. You. Oh, I can show you. Let me, I'll show you a coil that's in the process of being rewound. Great. Hey, Chris, this is Andrew. Um, I have a Accutron meter, but I'm trying to find an Accutron watch. Where would be the best place to, to find a kind of like a trusted dealer that has Accutron watches for sale? A trusted dealer? Uh, like, are you talking about a, a serviced watch that's already? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm talking like a deep sea, an astronaut, you know, one that's been serviced, ready to go. Uh, as Tim indicated, doesn't hum too loud to keep me up at night. Um, but I, I'm a little bit of a chicken to go on uh, eBay. I got to be honest with you. Uh, I, I'd rather uh, kind of follow the buy the seller concept. Um, but I, I really, I'm, I've been looking for years now to try to find, you know, that Accutron watch, and I just haven't found one yet. I don't think I know the answer to that. Um, okay. I don't really buy and sell watches. I only do repairs. Okay. So no, no, I don't know. Maybe maybe somebody else has an idea for that. Yeah. Uh, un unwind in time. Unwind in time. Um, they, they, they're they more uh, balance wheel, Hamilton uh, 500 series stuff, uh -huh. but they do uh -huh. sell Accutrons as well. And I think he also services Accutrons this that is, he sells. Uh, I, I agree. He is a good guy and he sells... Um, I've bought a watch from him and, you know, of course, looked at it as soon as I got it. He says it's serviced. I got it. It's serviced. It's serviced competently. Uh, a lot of sellers, when they sell you a watch, it says it's serviced. Of course, it's just not. We all are familiar with that problem. Where are they located? I also recommend Jarrett. 
Um, I I don't know where he is. He he sells through a website. I do I have his card here? I have his card here. Yeah, if you do a search on Unwind and Time, he's there. I've met him at the uh, pop-up um, Wound and Worn uh, pop-up shop in New York City um, in 2019. He was there uh, with his wife, I believe. Yeah, I've met him somewhere too, and I don't remember where. So the, um, thing about, the thing about uh, tuning fork watches and Accutrons in particular is that they were made in very large quantities. Um, in 1972, Bolova had 22 plants in operation and they owned Universal Geneva at that point and they had a Citizen going full bore um, building tuning fork watches. So there's a lot of inventory out there. And I buy $25 Accutrons off eBay, you know, if they look interesting to me. And a lot of times they have issues, but, you know, I'm not too scared of them. Tim, I have more than 100 Accutrons. Um, <laughs> so I'm very interested in it. And Andrew, if you're welcome to reach out, I'd be happy to chat with you, talk with you about them. Uh, if you find an interesting one, I'd be happy to try to steer you. Um, okay. I don't know whether any of you folks are on Facebook or want to be on Facebook, but one of the reasons I stay on there is there's actually a very um, active Accutron group now on Facebook. Okay. And uh, I am surprised people very young, I'm talking like 16, 18 years old, all of a sudden got dad or grandpa, <laughs> granddad's Accutron and are interested in it. So it's nice to see that, but I'd be happy to help in any way I could. Yeah, John, thank you. I'm kind of looking for that connection. And while I got the microphone, I just want to thank Tim and Chris. This has been fascinating. I've had a love of these ever since I inherited my dad's uh, broken one and had it repaired. And it obviously has become somewhat a sickness for me. <laughs> and I have learned so much from you two today. So it's been great. And I thank you for doing this. Oh, great. Thank you, John. What and I ask you collectors about this is the astronaut Mark II. Uh -huh. Can you tell me a little bit about it? <laughs> the, the Mark II has two hour hands. And um, when yeah. you turn the top crown, yeah. one of the hour hands jumps by an hour. Doesn't move smoothly. It jumps in hour increments. It's really cool. Very complicated mechanism under the dial there. If you jump it forward past midnight, it changes the date. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's the coolest watch. And so it still has um, a second hour hand that stays in the same place so you can leave yep. that for your for your home time zone so if you're in an airplane every time you cross a time zone line you jump that hand up one and when you're going home you jump it back the other way so neat what a cool watch <laughs> hey, thanks for showing us that jack i don't have one of those to show right now i've been cheating and showing you customer watches don't tell anyone okay here is here is a coil let's see how I, that's as far out as i can zoom with my microscope this is a 214 coil with the wire stripped off and the protective coating stripped off that's ready to go on my winding machine. That's what it looks like underneath there. And then here's one that's got the wire on it, but is not soldered yet. Let's see how many focuses it. There we go. You might be able to see the ends of the wire there. Let me if you can solder it. Yep, you can see one there. Yeah, super. Actually, you can see all four wires there. There's four of them yeah. that need to be soldered because this one has two windings in it. One is for sensing the position of the magnet and the other one is for driving it. Um, so those are 15 microns that that wire diameter is there. There's some um, seven or 8,000 turns of wire on this little coil. And if I can get my dime back in there to give you an idea, just the Dion dime. Seven or 8,000 turns? Yeah, there's about 8,000 turns on that. There, there may be a little more on these um, because uh, modern batteries have a higher voltage than the original mercury batteries. Sometimes the amplitude of the fork is a little high in some of these movements. And so when I rewind them, I put more windings of wire on to compensate for that. It gives them a, a little bit better amplitude, easier to tame if you're servicing it. So yeah, um, after that's wound on there, um, I solder those wires, clean up the flux, and then I coat it all with a protective coating so that it doesn't get damaged. Uh, when it's serviced next, um, a lot of 
these uh, fail from corrosion from the battery. And the other thing I see all the time is that they're just uh, damaged in servicing or gouged with the cap of the tuning fork, something like that. Very frustrating. <clears throat> a lot of there's there's hours of work in each one of these that I do, so so I don't like to see them damaged. But um, as far as I know, I'm the only one rewinding those. Back to the regular camera. Any other questions for me? I've got a 150 watt soldering iron. If you need that for. <laughs> That one that they use for uh, for rain gutters and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the uh, technology for rewinding uh, your coils, you have a little Linux uh, CAD controlled winding machine that you've created, or is this something that you've bought uh, off the shelf? Um, it is my own design and my manufacturer, and I don't want to show it to you for that reason. No problem. <laughs> that <laughs> it, 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 it's it's it is fast. controlled and it is based on Linux, like you said. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating to see that the coil form shape is that it's actually a bit of a cone. So, you know, they varied the amount of magnetic force depending upon the position of the magnet within that coil form. Yeah, in the 214, the cone is a magnet and the coil, or, or the, let me say that again, the magnet is a cone shape and, and the, the coil form is also a cone shape. In the 218, they dispensed with that for whatever reason, and they're both cylindrical instead. So that's um, a little bit easier to get wire on because you, you have the same number of windings, you know, over the whole form instead of having to wind that that shape uh, for the 214. So it's a little bit trickier. And in the, the ESA movement, the 9162, it's also cylindrically shaped, um, same as the 218. So yeah, they, they uh, I'm not sure why they changed that. I, I don't have any insight into that. Yeah. So a couple of comments on the care and uh, feeding of, of Accutrons. Uh, in general, if they haven't been serviced, I, I always say, don't turn the hands backwards, always go forwards because if the clutches are kind of sticky, uh, you try and turn it backwards, you put uh, backward forces on the index wheel and can bend the tines or pop the jewels off. Is, is that true? Um, or? It depends. Uh, on the 9162 movements, they don't actually have a brake that holds the gear trade in place while you're setting the hands. The 218, I think, is a better design, and it does have a brake that engages when it's in hand setting mode. So um, the the 218 is a lot more tolerant of not being serviced. But um, like we've both tried to stress, that center wheel assembly does get worn out really easily if there's no grease in it and you set the hands. Uh, either direction, it doesn't matter because it, it has to slip in that spot when you set the hands. Uh, so the on the 218, that part, aside from these pivots being, being worn away and ruined, um, that center wheel is generally the only thing that I find wrong with them. At this point with the center wheel, some people have said you can try and smack them with a rounded punch uh, to try and spread them. Have you tried using those three-sided pointy things uh, on the staking tools that you can use for shrinking holes like on yeah. roller jewels? I have tried various things. I have managed to tighten them, but uh, they don't end up centered very well. And they have they have a very picky alignment because the teeth are so small and I just haven't had much luck tightening them. Uh, fortunately, I've not run out of the parts yet. We'll see how that goes. With, with all of this, I, as, as we get lower on parts, um, it's more critical that people have their watches serviced to save them as long as possible. We also get more creative <laughs> in fixing them. And so, um, you know, of course I never throw anything away. I have, I have a bunch of those center wheels and one day I will have to figure out a good way to tighten them, I'm sure. And I'll do that at that time. But, but like the rewinding, um, you know, 20 years ago when I started fixing Accutrons, we still had coils. We could, we could uh, get on the Dash 2 website in 99 or whatever and, and order coils for 65 bucks or so. And of course it wasn't worth rewinding them then. Now it's worth it. I, I have uh, people who buy them, other repairmen who buy them in bulk from me, rewound at $200 a piece. It's worth my time to do now. 
the 218 coils, they're still easy to find. Someday I'll rewind them, probably. I, I don't know. It's not worth it. You can buy them for 30 or 50 bucks. Chris, so I've, got a, I've got a space view. I've got a standard 214. Um, they haven't been serviced, I'm sure. They, they, they should be serviced. Is that what you're saying? I ought to send them off and get them serviced? I, if I, don't, I don't wear them. There's not a battery in them. But, oh, if, you don't, if you're not running them, no need. Um, I, I think the most damage comes when somebody finds, you know, dad or dad's or grandpa's watch hasn't been serviced. Well, maybe never. I get some that have never been serviced since they were new. You know, grandpa wore it from 60 to 70 and it quit working and he put it in a drawer. Someone finds it now, 50 years later, sticks a battery in it. it and uh, those pivots are rusted in place and it twists them all off. And I get those sometimes and, and it's kind of sad. But um, so, yeah, if, if you're just storing them, I wouldn't bother. It, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of expensive to have them serviced if you're just going to keep them. Um, but if you want to wear them, I would, I would do it before putting batteries back in them. In terms of setting problems on 214s, they're back set. So they got this little uh, <clears throat> lever that you flip up and the case design on the 214s usually have a gasket between the case back and the the body itself so so what happens is as the rubber shrinks the or gets tightened down too tightly you can't set the watch because you can't get the the crown pulled out far enough all of us you know would say we'll change the stem that seems to be a little crazy uh, any comments on dealing with setting issues on 214s oh yeah always put a new gasket in them it fixes it okay stems don't grow or shrink over time but those gaskets sure do change so yeah just just replace that gasket if you're having setting trouble and you can get those gaskets from Auto Free and such, Auto Fry. Um, I buy them from I buy them from a guy on eBay, and, and I don't know what his name is. I can't think of it. But he's he's the guy who makes the reproduction uh, modern space view crystals, astronaut crystals, stuff like that. He makes quite a few modern replacements for Accutron parts, and I buy his two fourteen gaskets. The 218 gaskets, mm -hmm. I don't have any trouble getting, so I don't I don't pay his prices for those. But but yeah, and all of them with every service, I just replace that gasket and it, it keeps it from having trouble. And Very keeps good. the water out too. <laughs> That's also important. The um, so if you just search on eBay for space view crystals or something, you'll eventually find the guy quickly enough. Yeah, or the, so. the Accutron part number for that uh, for that uh, back gasket. It's easy to find on there. And in the case of the 218s, um, the, the case backs, you know, there's nothing critical tolerance wise on those. So, you know, the gasketing is a little less of, of an issue. So I'm going to do a screen share and show some uh, pictures from my collection, if that's all right. Jack's first. He's showing off something else he's got there. Okay. That's Jack, the speak some more so that you... This is the Omega F300, uh, 300 Hertz. And um, when I opened it up, uh, it had been repaired and the repair part in it is, is marked Lon Jeans. So it oh. had interchangeable parts, same, mm -hmm. same basic movement. Omega is the only one who gold plated those bridges though. So it, it, it is a little bit of a difference. The, the, the ones that you find in the Omegas are better finished. They have nicer screws. Even the tuning fork is better finished in those. Well, only only a piece of it. It had been repaired and been replaced with a part that was marked Lon Jeans. Oh, I see. Okay. So the part that they replaced, and I'll show pictures of this when I do screen sharing, The that particular ESA movement is like a motor module and four screws hold it on. And the service manuals say before you take the uncase the movement, you remove that motor module uh, with the coils and the uh, index wheel and all that to keep the index wheel from getting damaged if you bump the hands. So it's really easy to swap those around. And I've done that as well. It's unfortunate that, you know, they did that though, because, you know, you really kind of want to keep those things with the movement. But... And Omega also puts the serial number of the watch on that, on that plate that you're talking about that's so easy to swap. So yeah, you can lose that too. The, uh, you can, 
strip all the parts off, and I assume if you heat the uh, that plate up on a coffee warmer or something, you can eventually pop that serial number tag off and move it to a different uh, back if you really want to. Again, it's one of those things. What I have found mostly is that coils are bad on those modules, and so you don't need to swap the whole module. You just find the uh, replace the coils, which is another three screws, and I can show. Uh, pictures of those here in a screen share. There's a picture of the plate in my Omega. It shows in the middle there. You probably can't read it. It shows the serial number. In there. But yeah, the Omega ones are are much more nicely finished than anybody else's, and they're all gold plated. Yes, mine says Lon Jeans. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so these are um, you know some pictures of my collection. Uh, this is an AccuQuartz uh, marine chronometer. They called them Navigators. And the first uh, ones were based on three uh, 214 movements, 120 degrees off, all with the uh, resonating uh, forks in them, but only the top movement was connected to the dial. But this one is based on the um, the the two uh, the 224 AccuQuartz movement, and you could get these in. Um, 24 hour, 12 hour versions. So this is kind of the case. I didn't have a picture of all of it. Um, so let me, uh, this is a long jeans project that I've been working on or had been working on. So these are, um, this is a chronograph version of, of the Swiss movement. So there, there's three plates to it. There's the top plate with the, uh, the date and day disks on it. And that's got the chronograph module. And then the module with the coils, that's what I call the motor module. And that can be taken out with the four screws. And then the other module is kind of the top module, which would have the motion works for uh, the hands and, and the date wheel if it was a non-chronograph version. These are flipped over and they all kind of slide together. I believe the chronograph module was a Dupraz module, the same guys that built the chronograph module for the micro rotor based automatic uh, chronograph watch that was used, um, you know, the Hewer Cal 12 and such. Um, this is showing a coupling of the, the seconds drive up to the chronograph module and then also the date change um, wheel extended this is looking at the side of this long jeans watch and you can see that the chronograph buttons are actually on a different plane than the um, winding or the setting crown. And that's how you can tell typically if a watch is, is a module based chronograph, if, if things aren't in line, it's not always the case, but in this particular case design is the movement comes out the front, you pull the bezel off and that's the dial on this one. So here are the uh, coils for the, uh, the ESA based module. So this is a question for Chris. This, one of the things that I will do is I'll run th that whole movement section with the coils taken off through the cleaning machine to sort of clean the surface of the index wheel and the paws and everything in place. And quite often they will run really well once you take them off, you know, running completely dry. So what's the risk of having not taken it apart like you're supposed to and servicing it? Well, the, the real risk there is you have no way of, of uh, getting oil into those capsules. So uh, this is a little kind of slow vi mo video of the last tuning fork design that Omega did. And they call that the Megasonic 720. And it has this little crazy module with the micro motor in it that spins and is magnetically coupled to gears underneath. Um, totally crazy, um, totally crazy design, but it, it didn't violate the uh, uh, bull of the patents. And that's the last tuning fork watch that Max Hetzel had designed. So this is a watch that um, Chris serviced for me. Um, so that's a later, uh, actually a 219 based movement uh, Mickey Mouse. And then this is another one that he serviced for me. And this is a um, 214 based. And then this is the uh, Accutron or the Astronaut. So it's got a, a third hand added, a 24 hour hand and it has this 24 hour bezel on it. This one doesn't have Astronaut on it. And Chris, um, I've heard that some early ones didn't have that on. Do you know any, any comments on that? Um, 
I have heard a lot of debate about these early astronaut dials, and I don't feel like uh, I know the facts well enough to say. Looking at the font on that dial, I kind of suspect that maybe it's been refinished uh, because that the the printing looks maybe a little bit off to me. Okay. The, the luminous is, is really bright, like maybe it's been redone. It's really it's really hard to say. Do you happen to know what year this one is? Um, yeah, I can pull the uh, the back up, but yeah, now now that I look at it, uh, it definitely uh, the font doesn't look consistent uh, across. So I'll I'll show a couple others. Um, I mean, if it's if it's got a, a sixty two or sixty three date, maybe more likely that it's original, but I don't know. Another one of those you talk about aging eyes. Yeah, so this says M five on it, so it's uh, 65. I, I would guess that the, the dial has been repainted then. So, and this bracelet is kind of what they call a coffin link style bracelet, I believe. Then this is a, a black dial and um, it's on what um, I think we call the, a bullet style bracelet. And this is a different version of the S you know, black dial, different style hands. And I don't know, uh, Chris, if you've experienced a lot of hand variations in the astronauts. Um, I, th I think those are all correct. They, they came all sorts of ways. Okay. You can, you can find, this is one of those cases where pretty much what we have to go on is the old advertisements and that catalog that you were showing earlier. Okay. Yeah. If you look through those, you, you can find all sorts of variants of the astronaut. They just, they Bolova change stuff willy nilly. They change stuff over time. It, it, it's hard to say exactly what's right and what isn't now. The um, other thing with these is if you're wanting a 214 uh, kind of watch, but you want a bigger one, the astronaut gives you that bigger size because it has that bezel. So it's a more contemporary sized um, watch. Uh, this watch, Chris also serviced for me. This is the deep sea version of a 218 day date. And um, some of these you'll see where the day and the date are silver. And this one is got a black uh, day of the week um, disc. So I don't know if that's original for that or not. Um, and I haven't looked at the advertising on it. Another look, and then this is another watch that Chris serviced for me. And this one, they think they call this the astro astronaut as well, or it's listed in the collector's book as, as an astronaut, but I see it as the deep sea really. Jim, were these eBay finds or did you find them with regional roundups or? The astronaut with the reprinted dial came from Boulder's uh, Salvation Army. Uh, that was the first, one of the first two Accutrons I bought, and uh, this particular one I bought at our regional, one of the regionals in Denver, one is still at the airport near, um, near, near the airport, at the hotel near the airport. This is one where the hand worked, and the guy said it worked, and I thought it worked, and then I realized, gee, the time's not changing at all. So oh. this was one with the slipping clutch, and I actually didn't wear it do anything with it for you know probably 10 years and finally i i just took the dial off in hands and flipped flipped the gear around on that pinion you can pop that um that gear off the, the pinion flip it around and snap it back on and and sometimes it works a little better and that's what i did but chris serviced it and uh got it reassembled correctly because i hadn't got the springs in right okay thank you and uh this the other um 214 type watch that's bigger more contemporary sized are some of these space views uh, this was my other first watch, uh, Accutron, and that also came from the Boulder Goodwill store. I think I paid um, like $190 for the Astronaut and something like 75 for this one, which was a lot of money at the time and, and also for Goodwill. It was something that I wanted, and then I had it serviced by Bruno Amon at Swiss Chalet in Boulder when they were still open. And this is a silver version of, of that previous watch. You notice the crystals are a little different on the on them though. So that one's just got the tuning fork and Accutron, and this one says Boulevard Accutron. Um, Chris, do you got any comments on on the different crystals types? Do you know those? No, I don't. Uh, they there are a lot of variations that I know are correct. Like there's um, for the gold filled uh, smaller case, you know, the plain round case. 
I know there was one with the fork at 12 and Accutron at eight like this. And then there was another one with both of them at eight. And both those crystals are correct. And I don't think there's any pattern as to which came on which watch. Okay. And both in the, in the material. So I, again, this is just another thing where I think the, you know, the salespeople said, we think that, oh, okay, there's one with the fork at 12. That's a, that's a Swiss model space view though. Uh, but but you'll also see them with the fork down at eight with the logo. And okay. As far as I know, all those are correct from different times. So kind of interesting story about the the Space View watches is that when the Accutron was first released, the Space View was strictly a salesman's model that the uh, retailers would have these on display, and customers wanted they were buying those off the dealers. Dealers basically told Bulova, you need to start issuing these as a real product and they did. So here's a, a smaller kind of a, a decorative style, you know, dress style, gold, you know, two-tone kind of thing. And this is another uh, pretty popular uh, case style, uh, TV case, asymmetrical. This is a snapback uh, case. This is 14 karat gold and it's a smooth bezel catching reflections in my light tent. Elvis Presley had one of these. And surprisingly, this model isn't listed in the Accutron collector's book, but maybe it because it was such a common model that uh, they didn't feel a need. That's... And I think Tim, those this, this uh, TV case one was only made the first year. Okay. That's one of the original 1960 models in those very early advertisements. And they didn't make them very long. It's a very neat okay. model. You have a gold buckle with it too? Is that original? I believe it is. Awesome. I think yeah, that's see, saying M0 yeah. on there. Yeah, I'll have to see if that's actually 14 karat just plated. So this was uh, the Woody version. And uh, this is a relatively recent acquisition. The original band, which this one didn't have, was a really crazy mix of uh, gold mesh and wood insert kind of thing. And then this is a plastic uh, wood grained insert like you would have had on the side of your parent station wagon maybe growing up and black dial. This is one where the uh, all the pictures I see of this watch, the day date uh, discs are silver, and this one has a black uh, date disc on it, so maybe somebody thought it looked better on the black dial, but they didn't get it on right because it's not snapping uh, to the correct position, and yeah, that's kind of a close-up of it. This one is uh, one of those astronaut Mark IIs, and Chris, I'd like you to work on this one at some point. All right. That's a that's a variant that doesn't have the two hour hands. It has the window for the uh, for the home hour, and then when you right. turn the top crown, the the hand uh, snaps between the hours, like I was talking about earlier. It's the same same movement almost, but uh, with the hand replaced by that wheel. Okay. And here's a couple of variations on different case styles, just kind of going rambling through a bunch of, you know, you had these chunky square and semi-square pieces. These are 218 base, you know, just kind of variations. Another TV style uh, there on the left. You know, the two leftmost watches, I think I got them off eBay for $25. You know, they, they have issues with them, but, you know, they're not expensive. And then these are uh, three 218 dress style kind of watches. These don't have the the day or date on them so they've got the simplest mechanisms here we get into some of my omega collection so these are a mix of megasonics f300s and then the uh, speed sonic uh, chronograph versions this you know crazy case they call this the lobster this is one of chuck maddox's uh, favorite watches for a while it's got a mirrored dial on it um, silver it's re catching reflected light uh, the swiss day date mechanism had a major design flaw and, and chris really doesn't like them for this reason one of the one of these reasons they tend to eat the teeth off your day and date disc and they're kind of expensive so in this one they just uh, took the disc out and covered the the window up with you know a little bit of plastic or something I haven't seen that before. And uh, then this is kind of a, a grained um, blue dial. Uh, and you see the uh, hand down below has fallen off. Uh, that seems to be pretty common with these things. And I assume you have some issues trying to set the hands with the module-based design. And then they also did them in a 
gold in, in a cushion kind of a case design. They had different dial and, and hand styles slightly. So you see a couple of different colors and again, hands that have managed to fall off. Uh, there they are, you seeing the variations on the dial. Those are side by side showing the variations. And these are the Megasonics. The Megasonic 720 Hertz, that was developed in conjunction with the Omega's Quartz development. And basically, the you know, in the end, Quartz won out. These Megasonics were produced in much smaller uh, quantities, and so they're rare. And of course, they're kind of fussy to work on due to the nature of their uh, design. This is a Constellation branded round version, Megasonic. Uh, this is a lobster version in the Megasonic. And this is the uh, Megasonic module. So it's got this unusual uh, coil design. Then there's that little micro motor uh, with the enclosed index wheel floating in oil inside there. And it's magnetically coupled to gears behind it. And there's two gears in this train that don't have teeth on them. They are magnetically coupled. It's a really low friction transfer kind of thing. Just a totally crazy design. And uh, showing the case back, you know, there's you see variations. You see some with that previous deeply stamped uh, sea monster, and then this one with just kind of an engraved back. Um, there is a constellation back and those showing uh, variations on the bracelets of the lobster. They took this special bracelet and the one on the right is got uh, basically a, a cable, steel cables going through the, the segments that are welded to the segments and they have a tendency to stretch over time or break and so, you know, they, they're, they're not super great in, in some respects. The watch on the left is another variant that you see. That bracelet came out of Omega's Mexico uh, plant or the contractor that they use. So they're they're kind of interesting and you, you sort of see the uh, differences on, on, on the links. And there's a couple of them side by side, some replacement ex extendo links for the uh, lobster bracelet, a couple of variations on the uh, cushion shaped bracelet style. The bracelet on the left mounted on the watch is made in Mexico. The bracelet on the right is a Swiss made bracelet, a couple Seamasters. These are the F300 variants. I'm not sure that this is a correct dial in this one. I have to research that more case backs. This shows the case design of the lobster. It's a two part case or three part case to count that the back is a piece, but there's an O-ring that friction fits this into the that ring that then holds it to the uh, the bracelet and the dial on this one, the uh, top coating is flaking off close up of the case. And then these are some round dress versions of Omega's, the DeVille, you know, with the DeVille logo constellation with the observatory, another observatory, DeVille with plain case back. And you tend to see a lot of plain case backs on Omega F300s just flat with no um, designs on it. And then these are more of those, those cone-shaped uh, variants, Seamaster variants. Uh, you see some with the crown at uh, three o'clock and some with the crown at uh, kind of two o'clock. And this one, it's got a kind of an integrated tapered bracelet on it and Omega is on the top, the applied uh, Omega logo. And this one, the applied logo is on the bottom and it's got a, um, a, a narrow a straight bracelet on it, but otherwise it's kind of very similar. And then this one has an incorrect crown on it and that's kind of what the case looks looks like. And his dial. So these, these um, cone-shaped cases are also three-part cases. There's an outer, ring that screw ring that if you can get it off you can separate the cone from the uh, the body that holds the bracelet and you can refinish the um the case which some people do and some do better jobs than others the upper watch in this picture has been refinished and then this is a long jeans version of that chronograph movement similar to that one that i was showing earlier that i was working on these have a pretty special bracelet and even the uh, spring bar that goes into the case is special. So if you're gonna buy one of these, you wanna get it with the uh, original bracelet. And Long Jeans called their version Ultronic. 
and a couple kind of odd cushiony shaped things, not a particularly attractive design. And then this is a unisonic. Um, so this is Universal Geneve. And so this is uh, built under a Bulova license and they built uh, movements for Bulova. And uh, they also did their own uh, version of the 218 movement. And they actually uh, did a better job, I think, of the, uh, of the movement because they fixed some other some of the problems. Fortunately, I didn't realize this when I bought it, but this is missing the bezel. This was one of these eBay purchases where the pictures weren't that great, and I got it over a decade ago. So I have to find a, uh, a parts case now to get a bezel off of it. But this has got the two hand or the three hand version, and uh, the close up of the Universal Geneve. This style, you see the bite marks on it. I think this was probably cut out of a gold case in a gold scrapper, but uh, Universal Geneve called theirs Unisonic. And it looks very much like a, a 218 movement, but uh, the finish is a little different and obviously uh, done. And just uh, more pictures of the unisonic. And this is a no-name chronograph version of, of the Swiss movement. And I don't know who made this and if this was some sort of demonstration piece or if it was intended to be private labeled and, and never got private labeled. But I've seen a few of these out there and not too many. And these are Movados. Movado called theirs electronic, and uh, they have a Zenith branding on them. A couple different case designs. This is a 14 karat snapback case. Previous one uh, was a two piece screw on back, and this is a one piece screw on back. And then this is TV cased Movado. So here we got some of uh, these uh, transistor coils that always fail on, on the Swiss movements, the ESA movements. And here um, you see people trying to uh, repair them using silver paint. Sometimes if you cut some coils, wires on the coil, but the edges are bright and they're visible, people try putting silver paint on them and sometimes it works. Have you ever had any luck with that, Chris? I've never put that on any coils, but I've sure gotten some. Uh, I've gotten enough that way that I'm pretty sure it usually doesn't work. Yeah. I think if you if you happen to break only only one wire, that might fix it. But if you if you break more than one winding, you'll create a, a shorted winding that goes all the way around, and it, it it'll never work. Yeah, it it have a really odd odd uh, characteristic. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is another just movement um, that I got in a lot of movements. So this is uh, my my Beta Twenty One watch that I recently got. And it runs, but it runs super fast. Yep, that's very common. And um, the comment on these Beta 21s is, you know, they tend in the, uh, the most of them were sold by Omega. And in the stainless steel, they don't seem to be worth all that much. They offered these in gold, and they're also sold by different people, including Bulova, who participated in the development of this movement. And the gold cases were so massive that most of them got scrapped. But if you have a gold case, uh, Beta 21 movement or, or watch, they've they, they become pretty valuable. And you see different variations of layout on the movements. Uh, this is what's in the watch running. And then this is a movement that I bought off eBay that doesn't run. And it's got a slightly different layout. So I guess different age. And I'll just show this off. This is a Franken watch, uh, a former Boulder member. His name was Randy White. But he bought this case off eBay as new old stock, probably from the Australians. And then he sourced, um, I think, a long jeans movement and hands and dials. It's not the correct dial for this type of watch because it's a matte black dial and it should be one of those metallic dials. But um, it's basically a new condition. And then he had a friend gold plate the movement for him. So it was a nickel finished movement uh, with the Geneva stripes. And he wow. got it gold plated and That's put together. Dedication. It's uh, one of these days I'm, I'm going to put a, an actual correct movement in there with the correct dial and such. I'm showing a couple of the Swiss movements here. Um, the leftmost is the time and day date. And the movement on the right is the chronograph version with the day date. And you see that big uh, open space in the middle. That's so that you got a, an area for your subdial 
uh, axles to come through. And this is a pocket watch version of the uh, Megasonic watch. You can also find these with an F300 in them. Unfortunately, it's just got a plain case back. I think it would be cool if it had the DeVille, DeVille logo on it. And then these are pictures of those 218 center wheel uh, clutch wheels that are the problem child of the 218 and uh, you can see how they just kind of snap on there. These are all the parts you have to take off to get to that wheel that's up there on the brightly colored piece of paper. So it's a challenge and that's the end of this. I, I have a question. This is Nan here from Milwaukee. Now it's more for Chris because I'm wondering on those little small wires, those Pauls that have the jewel, the teeny tiny jewel at the end, how do they connect the jewel to that wire? And would you would you ever be able to uh, put it back if it was detached? On, on those, the wire has uh, two bends in it to kind of go around a corner of the jewel and then the jewel is epoxied onto the wire. And um, I find them detached so infrequently that I haven't had to find a way to put them back on. They, they are just as, as small as they look. So um, at, least, at least for right now, with that not being a thing that I frequently find broken, I don't have any trouble just replacing those parts when I find a problem with them. Basically, there's enough parts movements out there that even if you didn't have a new part, uh, you could pull it off, in a, off an old parts watch. Definitely, yeah. And those are held on with a collet, right? So you can kind of pull them off like you're pulling a hairspring off. On the, on the 218, you can replace them and keep the old fork. On the 214, it would be a lot harder to do. Thanks. Okay. Sure, yeah. I have a few, if I may, to show, just to brag. All right. Are you seeing it? Yes. Okay. All right. So this one, I, I this one I bought for the band, you know, the bracelet, uh, because it's uh, it's a sort of uh, mesh with the uh, Accutron logos. It turns out the band is made by a company called Duchess. It's not made by Accutron, so I don't know what that was about exactly, but. Uh, I love the uh, look of that band. I'm going to clean it up and whatnot. Um, and uh, then we have uh, uh, Tim showed one of these, you know, uh, which I really love because of the uh, world time uh, calculator that's on there. This one, it really looks tacky. I'm not sure. It just looks cheap. <laughs> partially because of the case color and so on. There you are. Yeah, uh, it might be a 230 movement. I'm not sure. I, I don't remember. Uh, and then, of course, uh, another as, uh, astronaut Mark II, uh, like the one that Jack had. And then yet another astronaut Mark II with the uh, hour window, as like Tim showed. So there you are. That's a nice collection. You know, I have some pictures of those 230 movements. Um, unfortunately, I, I had real problems with that slideshow that I gave earlier. I, uh, but uh, those little 230, you know, the smaller women's type movements, they have these two right angle gears, worm gears arrangements in them to allow them to get the, uh, the, the power transferred. That's what Jack's showing us. <laughs> It is a slick Boy, little design. That's a 221. That's a really cool movement. Half size, got half a tuning fork. It only has one tang on it, doesn't it? No, that one's got that one's got two cups. But the uh, the tuning fork is is almost in a circle and it goes around the battery to make room for it in there. It's a it's a really neat movement, and the gear train on that is just tiny. It's down in the corner. And like Tim was saying, there's these worm gears, and one of them's at a right angle to the other. So it's tricky to service. Can't find a band long enough to fit around my wife's wrist. Oh, <laughs> yeah, those are neat. I think I get very few of those 221s, but I think it might be my favorite movement. They're so cool. Also, Jack, did you know that the 221 vibrates at 440 hertz? 
So if you listen to it, you can tune your violin to it. It's it's concert A pitch. Isn't that cool? It's, they're so awesome. So one of uh, Chris's other skills is you're a banjo player. Is that correct? I, I am a banjo player. That's true. So um, in terms of the screaming tuning forks, do you are there any rules of thumb as to what which ones are going to be noisier than others? Um, I don't know. Uh, the ones that you set on your headboard, those are the loudest. And the ones that you set on a folded up washcloth, those are the quietest. <laughs> yep. Just just set it on something that where it doesn't uh, doesn't contact something hard, you know, that makes a big old speaker. You know, was one of the things that I didn't um, show was uh, battery adapters for the, especially the, the the 214 watches. They have a tendency to sometimes not behave very well with one and a half volt uh, batteries in, in the modern world. So there's a thing called an AccuCell that has a little teeny Schottky diode added into a cap that's on the end that drops the voltage by two tenths of a volt because a forward conduction drop in a shot key diode is 0.2 volts. So that gets it down to the Accutron range, but it takes a smaller um, 395 battery behind it. So it doesn't last as long. Um, some people have said that, you know, the forks are vibrating too hard and, you know, they, a bull of a made adjustments in cuts on the fork near the base. Uh, have you heard anything about that it's or seen that um some forks have higher amplitude than others i haven't found anything that looks like that was a design change on purpose uh, i don't use the accucells myself i find that if uh, a 214 has amplitude that's so high that it can't be phased then it, it has a defective part often it's the resistor and the capacitor and i have a whole pile of those that you that I could show you that I've replaced. And uh, when I do that, uh, the current consumption goes down and you just get a, a better setup with a watch that can use a standard battery. Oh, fascinating that you're actually getting failures of, of passive components like capacitors that are actually causing the watches to over amplitude. Yeah, that's that's very frequent, especially on those on those very first years of uh, coils. So, you know, one comment on those very early um, Accutron 214s is that they used germanium transistors and later ones used silicon. And so the physical characteristics are different, but also germanium transistors stop working at like 70 degrees Celsius or something. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're in, in the Mojave Desert um, with your early 214, it might stop working in the desert heat. Uh, you, you raised a question that I've seen, there seems to be a lot of argument about the battery issue. Are these uh, AccuCell and other modifications, are they worth the trouble? Is it, is it, is it worth doing? I, I, like I said, I don't use the AccuCells. I don't find them necessary or helpful. Like Tim said, they use a much smaller battery, and so they give you a lot shorter life. Um, a correctly serviced and, and um, adjusted Accutron, and by adjustment, I mean the phasing is set up correctly, like according to those pictures that Tim showed. Um, they generally don't have trouble running with a modern battery. It's just no problem. And in fact, in the uh, 50th anniversary space view that was recently released, they use the same circuitry. They use a modern battery. It, it's just fine. So they reissued a tuning fork version? They did, yeah. Uh, interesting. In fact, yeah. they just rewound one of those coils about two weeks ago. Just sent it back. So okay. they're already failing. Those coils are already failing, and there's no parts available. Can you believe it? Wow. They just made those watches. It's so frustrating. You know, because I'd seen their um, other crazy looking thing with that. Um, you know, charge accumulator and secondhand motor. And that, that seems to just be kind of a marketing gimmick. They also sold a Space View 2000, which uh, was actually based on a, a French quartz movement that had an auto winding generator, you know, kinetic generator on the front. Is a Jean, Jean Ives or something, Jean D. Ives or D. Jean Ives or something. Um, I've seen a few at our re at regionals in the past and you know people want a lot of money for them but they were 
sold in a limited edition right at 2000. I have not had one of those in. So in terms of what websites, um, electric watches, dot uk is one website that's got a lot on tuning fork watches that's real helpful for people and if you do a search on electric watches and accutron you'll come right up uh, there is an uh, i think an accutron 214.com or somebody's got a, a 214 themed website and they're ones that talk about uh, installing diodes in series with the coils and things like that. And uh, uh, crazywatches.pl, he's got some stuff on tuning fork watches and pictures of the insides. He's also got a picture of the drive coils of the Beta 21 as well. And uh, I'm sure there, there, there are others out there that I'm not remembering at this point. See you guys. Great show. I really enjoyed okay. it. Thank Good you. to see you, Jack. Okay. Appreciate you guys. logging in. See you, Lucas. Anybody else? Otherwise, we can call it a day. It's been a long one. All righty. I'm going to take off. See you guys. Okay. Right. Care, Thanks, Chris. Thank Appreciate you. it very much. You're welcome. It's been great. Thank you.